Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I want to welcome you to our midweek video this week. We appreciate you tuning in. As always, if you haven't already done so, if you consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell as a way of staying current with our ministry when we go live from our assembly building on Sunday morning, as well as when we create content for you here midweek, we would certainly appreciate that. Our featured book for this week is my book, The King James Bible in America, <clears throat> an orthographic, historical, and textual investigation. This book deals with uh, issues related to the printed history of the text in the United States and why that matters as far as an overall understanding of a pro-King James position. So if you haven't picked up a copy of The King James Bible in America, if you consider doing that as a way of supporting the ministry, we would certainly appreciate that. Also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this as an all-tech site should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So if you're into all-tech sites or just like an alternative to YouTube, please consider subscribing or checking us out here on Rumble as well. Those of you that have been following the channel here of late, you know that midweek I have been offering my thoughts on the Textual Confidence Collective. And last week I brought number 17, episode 17 in this particular uh, playlist, topic, and subject matter. And I said in that one, in Lesson 17, that I wasn't sure if I was done responding to the collective. Um, and so what I've kind of decided to do is move on to a different subject. Uh, that doesn't mean I might not have anything to say further about or get our thoughts on the collective um, moving forward or in the future. But for right now, I've decided to kind of move on into a little bit related, definitely related, but a different topic. OK, now, those of you who have been following my class from this generation forever. So this is the adult Sunday school class uh, at Grace Life Bible Church. We live stream this on YouTube, the church's web page right up here. If you click on live stream as well as on Facebook, both on my personal Facebook wall and on the Grace Life Bible Church Facebook page. <clears throat> Every Sunday morning at 9 a.m., we've been going through this now for a number of years. This past Sunday, I just taught Lesson 192. And if you can look here at the screen, you can see that the last three lessons, Lesson 190, Lesson 191, and 192, have all been about assessing the preliminary contents of the 1611 King James Bible. So we've been looking at the King James Bible, the 1611, as a historical artifact and trying to look at the preliminary material, ascertain what was included in that, and then what does that tell us, therefore, about the values, interests, and concerns of the of the people of the of early 17th century that put that volume together. So we have not so much been looking at the biblical text itself in the last three lessons, but more uh, uh, in the preliminary information. And what does that tell us about the, con the historical context in which the King James Bible was created originally in 1611 in the early 17th century? So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this, number one, because I would love for you to check out this class and look at these videos and process through this because I think there's a lot of good information here. Uh, some information that I've never necessarily seen presented um, in a systematic manner, the way that I'm trying to do that. Uh, so that's one reason. The other reason is it sets up kind of what I want to talk about. Okay. So when we think about the preliminary material, so I've been sort of and right now, this week, I'm knee deep in uh, pulling apart the preface. I'm planning a series of lessons in this class on a uh, proper perspective of the preface, because I don't think that the preface uh, to the 1611 is necessarily read well by parties on either side of the textual translational debate. I tend to feel like those who are on the pro King James side of the debate. <clears throat> And those who are in the, <clears throat> excuse me, modern critical text, modern version side of the debate, both sides read the preface and try to leverage the preface to, to, their, uh, to their aims and goals and, and try to cast the translators as though the translators would be wholly 
for them and wholly against um, the sort of the other side of that. And I feel that both sides of this debate do that with the preface. And so I have been uh, definitely endeavoring to try to understand it um, very clearly. All right. And not only that, but all the all the preliminary contents, actually. But the, the, the two things, the main thing has been my focus on the preface. Now, I haven't actually taught the preface yet. I'm going to begin doing that on Sunday. Uh, I've just sort of said a few things about it in a preliminary manner, actually in, in Lesson 192 from this past Sunday. But in my due diligence here, I have a book in my library here at home called The King James Version at 400, Assessing Its Genius as a Bible Translation and Literary Influence. And this is an anthology, a collection of essays related to this, these essays were presented in 2011 at a symposium, uh, academic symposium. And then for some reason, I'm not sure exactly why I haven't been able to ascertain the reason, the the volume here was published in 2013, uh, and it was put out by the Society of Biblical Literature. And there's an essay in this particular anthology. I'll just scroll down. I don't have access to all of this, so I'll just show you a few things. The essay is this one right here. Priorities, Principles, and Prefaces from the King James Version to Today by Richard A. Burridge, all right? Now, one of the things that Burridge talks about in this essay, and it's it's a point that um, I'd never really thought about but should have, and as I read the essay and I thought about what Burridge was saying, and then I started combing through the two prefaces. So let's just see what he says here, okay? He says, this is from page 197 in this essay. He says, interestingly, it is not always realized that there are two prefaces to the King James Version. In the United Kingdom, the better known is the dedicatory preface, which is addressed to King James himself. So that's what I've called in my classes the epistle dedicatory. So that's the first preface. It is the dedication of the volume to the king, okay? To the most high and mighty, to the most high and mighty Prince James, by the grace of God, King of Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, and translators of the Bible, with grace, mercy, and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. But then he talks about the second preface, which is the one written by Miles Smith, the translators to the reader that everybody knows about. And one of the interesting things that Burridge does in his essay is he, for every point that he makes, he always will connect both the epistle dedicatory with the uh, translators to the reader and try to show you how these two things go together, all right? So as I'm reading that essay and I'm starting to actually read through this material, um, I was reading it in two formats, okay? Here is the original format um, of the 1611. This is from a facsimile and you can see it has the old spelling and et cetera, old orthography. And then I also have a modern spelling one. Now, this is just modern spelling. This is not um, updated and modernized uh, in the way that some uh, I've seen it present the text of the, of the uh, epistle dedicatory or the translator to the reader presented um, in the past. OK, now, why am I making a video? I'm making a video because as I'm going through this information, as I'm reading the Burridge essay and many other ones and information, and I'm actually rolling up my sleeves for myself and digging into the preliminary material and reading like over the epistle dedicatory many, many times, um, something just leaped off the page at me that I had to investigate, all right? Now, I investigate this and talk about this in Lesson 191, um, which is part of the, the three lessons on the preliminary information. I talk about the epistle dedicatory here. And so we have a picture of it here. Just some brief information from uh, Dr. Gordon Campbell about it. And the first three paragraphs of the epistle are mostly high-level flattery directed at King James. Okay, Actually, if I'm being honest, as you know, as an American who thinks back about you know the American Revolution and independence from the crown and this kind of thing, so, some of the 
the language in it is like a little bit much uh, for me personally. Okay. So, uh, but anyways, very high level flattery of the king. But the fourth and fifth paragraphs are very important and they definitely merit further attention. And in the fourth paragraph, the king's role in the production of the AV is addressed. All right. So please note that I updated the spelling for ease of reading. So here we have the paragraph photograph taken right out of the facsimile. So that's this paragraph right here. Okay. There are infer there are infinite arguments, right? And so it starts here and then it ends right here. Uh, might justly require. And so what I did is I screenshotted that out of there, and then I also copied and pasted it out of the modern uh, spelling, modern updated orthography, okay? So let's just read this paragraph, and I'll try to explain why or what I'm seeing here that's important. So it says, so this is the fourth paragraph of the epistle dedicatory. There are infinite arguments of this, of this right Christian and religious affection in your majesty but none is more forcible to declare it to others than the vehement and perpetuated desire of accomplishing and publishing this work. So let's stop there. What is the author saying? And by the way, we don't know for sure who the author is. Observers do not think that Miles Smith wrote the epistle dedicatory because of the language being different than what we see in the translators to the reader. I have read most think it was Thomas Bilson, but we don't know for sure is the answer. But notice here, okay, there are infinite arguments of this right Christian religious affection in your majesty, but none is more forcible to declare it to others than the vehement and perpetuated desire of accomplishing the publishing of this work, okay? So there are many reasons why the king has religious affection, okay, but the most, the biggest example is the publication of the 1611. That is what I take that first clause to mean. Which now, so they're dedicating this volume, this Bible, that was produced at the king's behest to the king. That's the whole point of this piece, this written piece that we're looking at here, the Epistle Dedicatory, which now, with all humility, we present unto your majesty, so they're presenting the volume to the king. That's the point of what we're reading. For when your highness had once out of deep judgment apprehended how convenient it was. So they are crediting the king out of his deep judgment with apprehending how important it was to produce the volume in question. 1611. Okay. That out of the original sacred tongues... Hebrew and Greek, together, so the sacred tongues, together with comparing, with comparing of labors, so they're going to take the original sacred tongues, and then they're going to compare them with the labors of others, both in our own English and other foreign languages of many worthy men that went before us. So, they are crediting to the king's judgment the necessity that out of the original sacred tongues to compare them with the labors, both in our own English and other foreign languages, out of many who went before us. So that's those that went before, both in foreign languages and in their own tongue English, all right? that there should be one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. So this is the phrase, there should be one more exact translation of the English Scriptures into the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. Your Majesty did never desist to urge and to excite those to whom it was commended. Folks, they're clearly talking about the production of the, of the 1611, of the King James Bible. They're attributing it to, to his deep judgment. They're attributing it to the judgment of the king. He never ceased. He never desist to urge and to excite those to whom it was commended, that the work might be hastened. So talking about the production of the volume they're dedicating, and that the business might be expedited in so decent a manner as a manner of such importance might justly require, okay? So 
the context to me here is obvious that they're commending their newly produced volume to the king's majesty. They're accrediting it to his judgment, and they are saying that it is the production of a comparison process and laboring in taking the original lang- the original sacred languages, comparing them together with labors, both in our own and other foreign men of, of and other foreign languages of many worthy men who went before us. There should be there should be one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. So this phrase right here, one more exact translation. When I taught this originally in the lesson, where to go, this raised some questions about what does this mean, all right? Now, more is an adverb, exact is an adjective, and translation is a noun. So more is an adverb, exact is an adjective, translation is a noun. It is obvious that in the context of this, what the author of the epistle dedicatory is intending to say, when you take the whole context of the paragraph, that the volume that they are attributing to the king's judgment, that they are presenting to the king, that the king did never desist to urge or to excite uh, those to whom it was commended, is one more trans one more exact translation of the Holy Scripture in English. So one meaning another one, an additional one, more, okay, one of that is more exact, more precise, that has the that has the quality of exactness to a greater degree. So the king, so why bother going through seven years of all of this labor if there was not the intention of creating something that was better, more exact than what already existed? So it's clear to me in the context. Now, historically, we also need to think about a few other things here, okay? So let me find, uh, so this is the sum and substance by um, Barlow. Barlow is the one who records the proceedings at the Hampton Court meeting. So we can see it right here, the sum and substance of the conference, which it pleased His Excellent Majesty to have with the Lord's bishops and others of his clergy, at which the most of the Lords of the Council were present in His Majesty's private chamber at Hampton Court, January 14, 1603. Okay. And this is presented here by William Barlow. Barlow discusses the decision to produce a new Bible. The idea is floated by John Reynolds of the Puritan uh, Coalition at the Hampton Court Conference, where the idea is presented to the king for a new Bible. And here on on this page, we start to see the presentation and Barlow's notes, okay? So, um, so the motion has been made, um, to which motion there was at the present no gainsaying, the objections being trivial and old. So talking about Barlow's case, okay, and already in print, uh, often answered, only my Lord of London, well added. So that would be Bancroft, that if every man's humor should be followed, there should be no end of translating. Now watch. Whereupon his highness, that would be King James, wished that some special pain should be taken in the behalf, uh, in, in that behalf, excuse me, for one uniform translation. So the whole reason James is doing this is so that the English church would have one uniform translation and then watch professing that he could never see yet, that he could never yet see a Bible well translated into in English, but the worst of all, His Majesty thought the Geneva Bible, and this to be done by the best learned in both universities, after them to be reviewed by the bishops and the chief learned of the church, from that uh, from them to be presented to the Privy Council, and lastly to be ratified. <clears throat> by his royal authority. So the whole reason there's a translation going to happen here now is because James 
wants there to be, okay, should be taken, and there should be one uniform translation. And James explicitly states at Hampton Court, according to Barlow's notes, that he had not yet seen a Bible well translated into English. All right. So now it's nearly seven years later, and the volume is being dedicated to the king. And it is explicitly described as being attributed to his judgment using a procedure that includes the original languages, comparing them to the labors of others, both in our own and other foreign languages of many worthy men that went before us. So that would be those translators that went before, both in English and in other foreign languages. The, for, the English ones, James says that he had not yet seen a Bible well translated. And the net effect of this is the production of one more Bible that was done by the king's judgment that he never did decease to urge, desist to urge, etc. It is obvious that what is being discussed here in the epistle dedicatory is the volume that they are producing and presenting to the king that they say is one more exact translation into English. It's one additional one beyond what already existed. And that says this is completely consistent, guys, with uh, what it says <coughs> elsewhere in the preface. <coughs> so we could come into the preface here. <coughs> um, and we could look and search. Okay, so here we have a part of the translators to the reader. And notice how this dovetails with what is presented in the epistle dedicatory. Truly good Christian we, reader, we never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation, nor yet to make of a bad one a good one, but to make of a good, but to make a good one better, or out of many good ones, one principal good one, not justly to be expected against. That hath been our endeavor, that hath been our mark. So obviously they are going to take previous Bibles, English Bibles, and out of them they're going to make one principal good one, which is exactly, dovetails exactly with what uh, Bar, with what we see the king saying here at, at Hampton Court, and it dovetails exactly with what we see going on here in the preface. And when we consider the rules given to the translators by Bishop Bancroft, we know that rule number one said that they were to follow the Bishop's Bible unless the truth of the original demanded otherwise. And then rule 14, as they did that, it lists out what other English Bibles they were supposed to consult as they did the work. Tyndall, Whitchurch, Geneva, etc. Exactly what we see this preface, the epistle, preface number one, the epistle dedicatory saying. So the the the, the King James Bible, by, in the estimation of those that produced it, is a result of the king's judgment. The same king who said that he had never yet seen the Bible well translated in English, and he thought there needed to be basically one one principal Bible in use in the English church. Has his has his university professors, etc., out of the original tongues, together with the comparing of labors, both in our own and other foreign languages, of many worthy men who went before us, that there should be one more exact translation. It's very obvious to me that they are referring there to the Bible that they have just labored to produce. The historical context, the evidence is, in my opinion, overwhelming in that regard. Okay, now we can go back up here, though. Let's go back up. Um, so bear with me one second. And here we go. Now, all of that then raises the question of this little word right here, exact. Exact is the adjective. They are ascribing the adjective exact to the, tra to the noun translation. So they are saying that there's one more, that there should be one more exact translation. Now that is not, well, one more among the prior, ex prior exact translations, but one more that has the quality of being more exact than the previous ones, all right? So when we start looking at exact, we start entering now into a territory that is going to be interesting, all right? Now, before we get into exact, I want to pause here and I want to talk about the whole idea of quote unquote false friends. All right. Now, 
Brother Mark Ward, who is a part of the Textual Confidence Collective. Again, I perceive him to be the leader of that group. Maybe I'm wrong about that. If I am, I will certainly uh, apologize and retract it. But he published, authorized the use and misuse of the King James Bible. And I believe he did this in 2017, if my memory is correct. Nope, 2018. And in this, he talks about dead words and false friends. All right. And one of Brother Ward's main arguments for why people should read modern versions is because of what he calls false friends. All right. Now, I want to be fair and I don't want to be accused of misrepresenting anything. So Brother Ward, in conjunction with his book, has also produced a multi-part playlist here of false friends, 50 false friends in the King James Version. All right. So what I've done is I have taken his first one where he explains what a false friend is. And we want to watch maybe the first seven minutes of this and hear Brother Ward's explanation of what a false friend is. So here we go. I'm launching a new series of videos on false friends in the King James Version. Everybody knows that the KJV contains dead words, words we know we don't know, like immerse, bestead, and blames. But most English readers today don't realize that there are words in the King James that they don't know they don't know. Simple words like halt, commend, and remove. These are what I call false friends. These false friends are not the fault of the King James translators, and we are not at fault for misunderstanding them. False friends are just what happens when language changes over time. I am, Lord willing, going to produce a series of videos talking real simply and briefly through false friends in the King James. I'll teach you what they are, how to find them, and how to discern for sure that you found one. If you haven't already watched my video, KJV words you don't know you don't know, it might help if you did that, but let's jump right in with defining false friends. Most often, that terminology is used to speak of words in two entirely different languages that look or sound similar but mean different things, like embarrassed in English and embarazada in Spanish. That Spanish word doesn't mean embarrassed even though it looks and sounds like it. It means pregnant. Embarrassed and embarazada are false friends. But I use this terminology in a slightly different way. The way I define it, a false friend is three things. It's a word in the King James Version that we still use. It's a word that we use differently than did the Elizabethans 400 plus years ago. And it's a word where that difference often escapes English readers of today. They don't realize they're misunderstanding the intent of the King James translators in that place. The first and second elements of a false friend are pretty objective. You can use various tools I'm going to show you to discover how we use a given word and how our ancestors used it. But that third point depends on the reader. There are some skilled readers of the King James Version out there, and there are some easy false friends that don't trip up all readers, like the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But I have checked a number of these false friends with skilled, lifelong readers of the King James Version, and I have found that they are frequently tripped up by them just like I was until I learned how to do what I'm about to teach you. Understandest thou what thou readest? Let me show you how. Our so let's make sure we understand what Brother Ward said, okay? Number one, he's making a distinction between dead words. Dead words are words we know we don't know. So in other words, you're reading along in the text and you realize, and there's a, there's a word that you know you don't know what it means. That's a dead word, according to uh, Brother Ward's distinction. A false friend is a word in the King James that you don't know you don't know. So in other words, you're reading along and you encounter the word and you're not realizing that you're not getting maybe necessarily the exact meaning behind that particular English word that was there in the early 17th century because of language change. All right. And so he's got three criteria for a false friend. All right. Um, number one, again, it's a word in the King James that we still use. Number two, it's a word we use differently than the Elizabethans. And number three, um, it the difference escapes a modern reader of today. All right. So let's go on. And he's going to now walk you through the four steps that he uses to determine a false friend. Process for discovering false friends has four steps and a possible bonus step. We'll follow this process every time we deal with a false friend. Today, we'll look at 
halt, which is the word that finally made this whole concept of false friends click for me, we'll start with step number one. Notice a possible false friend. And there are two ways you can do this. A, you can do it through contextual conflict. Now, I did not notice that Halt was a false friend through contextual conflict. I didn't sense any conflict. I read right past this word and didn't realize I was misunderstanding. And you'd have to be a very good reader to notice false friends in this way. But in places it's more likely, like men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, 2 Timothy 3, 2. A reasonably attentive reader who knows contemporary English will realize that our current meaning of that word incontinent just doesn't fit in that list. Older people who have incontinence are not sinning. This word, set in a list of sins, is conflicting with the context. It must mean something different. Second way you can discern or notice a possible false friend is through regular checking of other translations. This is how I noticed halt. The King James Version translates a phrase in 1 Kings 18, 21 this way, and I had it memorized. How long halt ye between two opinions? And the ESV translates it, how long will you go limping between two opinions? That, to me, was funny. We, we don't use halt to mean limp today. This was a tip-off that halt might be a false friend. And in fact, the New American Standard Bible and the Christian Standard Bible, Standard American Evangelical English Translations, both mention that the Hebrew word in 1 Kings 18, 21 is literally limp or hobble. I'm presuming, of course, that you are checking other English Bible translations on a regular basis. If you're not, I think it very unlikely that you will discover very many of these false friends. Step 2. Look up the Hebrew or Greek word in a responsible original language lexicon. Lexicon just means dictionary. The most respected New Testament Greek lexicons are probably BDAG, Bauer, Donker, Arndt, and Gingrich, and Lonida, the most respected Old Testament Hebrew lexicon is Halot, the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, and its abridged little brother, Chalot, the concise Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament. If you are using Strong's or Vines or Thayer's or whatever free thing you found on the internet, you are not probably using a responsible tool. The reason Strong's and Vines and Thayer's are free is that they are out of copyright and are dated. They are certainly not always wrong, that's not what I'm saying but the most responsible students of Hebrew and Greek do not turn to these tools. So let's look at chalot, which, because it's abridged, is a little easier to wade through than halot. It says the verb here in 1 Kings 18.21 means be lame or limp, and it lists this very passage, 1 Kings 18.21. But does the English word halt mean limp? I thought it meant stop. We'll have to go to the next step to find out. Step three, look up the word in a contemporary dictionary to discover what it can mean today. Remember what a contemporary dictionary's job is. It's to guide its readers on how other English speakers use English. It doesn't tell you how people used English in 1611 necessarily, or certainly in 1427, or even in 1898. Although obviously there's a lot of overlap between our English and those historical Englishes. So what does my contemporary dictionary, my new Oxford American dictionary that comes standard on every Mac, say is the way people today use halt as verb? It says that we mean to bring or come to an abrupt stop. And that is precisely what I always thought Elijah meant in 1 Kings 18.21. How long will you stop between two opinions? I've asked dozens of other lifelong King James readers, and nearly all of them thought the same thing. The ones who knew it meant limp were all people who cheated. There are people who could also read Hebrew. But notice, my dictionary goes above and beyond by mentioning another sense of the word halt, one it calls archaic. And when this other sense was used without an object, it meant limp. This is great. It means I hardly need to go to our final step. Every once in a while, a contemporary dictionary will be all you need to discover a false friend. But that final step will be useful often. In fact, almost always we're going to have to check this fourth step to really confirm our read of a false friend. Step number four is look up the King James word in the Oxford English Dictionary to discover what the word could mean in 1611. This is probably the most difficult step because the OED is a technical tool for specialists. It takes some practice to learn how to use it well, but you must learn because there is no substitute for the OED. The OED is the only English dictionary that traces the meanings of all English words through time. 
That's why it's so huge, and expensive, and why it took decades for its first edition to be completed. When I say huge, what do I mean? Well, I happen to have a copy of the OED right here, the compact edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, and look how big and heavy it is. And look at this. This is a single page spread. It's actually eight pages on a spread that have been, you know, put there in tiny, tiny type for which they supply a magnifying glass that I didn't get because I got this from a friend who got it at a thrift store in Canada. There are... Just fun fact, I also, I have the exact same uh, hard copy of the OED that Brother Ward has. He, he got his from a friend in a thrift store in Canada. My dad uh, garbage picked my copy of it out of the garbage back in the 1980s. And it sat in his office for years. He didn't really even realize what he had until I came home from school one time for, or came home for Thanksgiving and realized what it was. And it had this little drawer with a magnifying glass and uh, my magnifying glass was lost also. Anyway, I it's it, just a little fun fact there. All kinds of references on each page. And this covers every word in English and in all the iterations of English that have ever existed. And this is just letters A through O. I also have here letters P through Z. This is unwieldy. I have to admit, I never use the paper editions of the Oxford English Dictionary. It's just too much. I am able to access it through my local library system. Contemporary dictionaries like Merriam-Webster and American Heritage and historical dictionaries like Webster's 1820. So I think that you get the point here about uh, Brother Ward's process, okay? So just just so that we're clear, um, number one, he's making a distinction between dead words and false friends, okay? And again, by a dead word, he means a word whose meaning you know you don't know. And second, a false friend is a word in the King James that you don't know you don't know because of language change, all right? Now, and then he has four steps that he uses to identify a false friend that he just went through. Number one, notice a possible false friend. You can do this either through contextual conflict or by checking other translations. Okay. Then second, you look up the word in a Hebrew or Greek respective uh, lexicon. Then you look the word up in a contemporary dictionary. And then you finally look up the word in the OED to determine whether or not there's a false friend. You know, on the particular example of halt, though, Here's the one in 1 Kings 18, 21 that Brother Ward is using to make his um, illustration there. I just wonder where in the process, uh, if there should be a step for comparing verse with verse. Because if we go to Matthew 8, 8 Matthew 18, 8, we find, uh, for it is better for thee to enter uh, into life halt or maimed. And talking about here, what? Cutting, wherefore, if thy foot offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, it is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Well, obviously, if I cut my foot off, then I'm going to be halt. I'm going to be limping. So it seems like um, in this particular one, you could have easily discerned it elsewhere by comparing scripture with scripture. Look at Luke chapter 14, verse 21. So the servant came and sh uh, showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. So obviously the halt would be people that have a walking problem. Um, and so um, while, so let, let me just be clear here and as fair as I can be, okay? And that would be to simply say this. Before I read authorized, I had come to the conclusion on my own that there that words in the King James Bible needed to be looked up in 17th century English language resources and or language resources like the OED that would tell you the historic meanings and give you examples of word usages, okay? I believe that before I ever read Authorized. When I read Authorized, and I've listened to probably everything Brother Ward has produced as far as his videos are concerned, I do have to admit that there are some words in the AV whose meanings have changed 
in ways that are sometimes imperceptible to modern readers that need to be looked up by uh, in, in English language resources by the day. Okay. And so we're going to take now and we're going to look at this word exact. I believe and I submit for you, for your consideration, that exact here is a false friend in the epistle dedicatory. That people read this and they ascribe a modern meaning and usage to exact that is different from what exact meant in the early 17th century when this Bible was produced. And this is an interesting case because this is not the biblical text. This is not part of the translation where the translators are rendering Hebrew and Greek words into English. This is part of just the epistle dedicatory, the, 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 the common everyday usage. So Brother Ward's step two of looking it up in a responsible lexicon uh, is 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 a moot point in this in this case because we're not looking at um, a Hebrew or Greek word. We're just looking at the English text of what the author of the epistle dedicatory said. But I would submit to you that this was a false friend. That this is a false friend. And when I read this, like I talked about earlier, in conjunction with the epistle de epistle dedicatory, in conjunction with the translators to the reader was as soon as this this jumped off the page at me and I said to myself I need to look up exact by in a 17th century English language source to see what exact meant because I immediately thought that this is being used differently than the way most people understand exact today so I'm taking the concept of a false friend and I'm applying it to the epistle dedicatory here okay now the first thing that I did then once I came to that realization in my study is I'm like, OK, well, I'm going to go to the table alphabetical first. I know the table alphabetical. Here it is, an alphabetical table containing and teaching the true uh, writing and understanding of hard, unusual English words borrowed from Hebrew, Greek, Latin and French. OK, and this was produced by Robert Condry at London in 1604. 1604 is the same year that King James authorized the production of the King James Bible to begin. So the table alphabetical is a primary source for the meaning of English words at precisely the same time that the King James translation was being done. All right. So the first thing I did when I thought that exact might be a false friend in the epistle dedicatory is I came into the... Um, table alphabetical and I tried to look up the word exact. So I went in here and I looked up the word exact and it's a little lag time. And here is exact, exact, perfectly done, perfectly done. Or to requite with uh, extra, extra mente, which is, which is a Latin phrase, but notice exact, perfectly done. Now, those of you that are familiar with the discussions about this, you can see already where I'm going with this, okay? Exact, by the standard of the day, in a 17th, early 17th century English language resource, meant perfectly done. So I'm like, wow, that's interesting. Perfectly done. I need to investigate that further, all right? So the next thing I did is I went to the lexicons of my early. Mo no, the next thing I did is I went to the OED. That's the ne that's why I queued it up next. I went to the OED and I typed in the adjective form of exact and I found this. Perfected. Consummate. Finished. Now look at this. Of qualities, conditions, attainments. Consummate. Finished. Refined. Perfect. So now we have the OED connecting the, the English adjective exact with perfect. And then notice what it says here, obsolete. So by the criteria that Brother Ward has set forth in many places for determining potential false friends, now we have the OED identifying a meaning of exact that is tied to perfect. Okay, a meaning of exact 
that is tied to perfect, um, that's obsolete. That's no longer used that way anymore. All right. Now, then we can look here at the uh, etymology, and we can see that this is from the Latin exactus. Okay. So the Latin adjective has the senses of highly finished, consummate, from the verb in the sense to complete, bring to perfection. So the English word exact is coming into English out of the Latin exactus, which also has the idea of bringing to perfection. Now, the table alphabetical said that exact meant perfectly done. So now we have the OED that is saying that exact is related to exactus in Latin, that that is related to something being brought to perfection. We can look here and see a definition that is related to perfect and that is marked obsolete. We can go a step further, and I've already done it. We can enter exact into a search on the lexicons of modern English, okay? And um, I'm just going to flip over to my notes on this because it's more readily available. So here's my screenshot of exact. Here's me loading this up. But there is also, a few years prior to 1604, the table alphabetical, Edmund Cudi published the English Schoolmaster that contained a similar definition for exact to the one published by Coundary in 1604, i.e. perfect. Okay, so there is another example here. So let's come back into the uh, lexicons of early modern English and let's just search for Cudi. And here it is, the English Schoolmaster, exact, perfect. So now we have a, a late 16th century uh, resource telling us that exact is related to perfect, okay? We could also and should also search for exactus. And when we do, we see that the first occurrence of this is in 1542. So well before the King James Bible, exactus, notice, past, very diligent, exact, okay? Perfectly done or performed. So the Latin exactus is meaning in English and tied to the idea of being perfectly done all the way back to 1542. Okay, exactus, again, this one dates from 1578, exactus, perfectly done. Okay, uh, 1587, exactus, perfectly done. Uh, let's go to 1589. Okay, here we have another uh, uh, instance of exact. This one's a little bit different because it's kind of the reverse in in the uh, um, set uh, in the way it's set up, but we can see that the table alphabetical defines exact as perfectly done. We can see that the OED identifies exact as coming out of exactus. We can come to the lexicons of early middle uh, early Middle English and early modern English, excuse me, and we can see multiple examples of it being tied to exact, or we can see exact being tied to perfectly done. We can look at the English schoolmaster and see exact being tied to perfect. And we can look at the table alphabetical from 1604, like I just showed you, and we can see exact being tied to perfectly done. And the OED says that there's a meaning of exact related to perfect that is obsolete. So at this point, you're kind of like, hmm, well, what are they saying? When they, what, what, what is the epistle dedicatory meaning to convey that there should be one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into English? So what we need to do then is then we need to look at perfect, all right? And it's interesting when we look at perfect. So let's, let's stop here and take stock of what we've seen. This has already been a fairly long video, okay? <clears throat> we have seen the English word exact having a meaning and usage historically in English that is related to something being perfectly done. We can see in the epistle dedicatory that the author is ascribing to the volume that is being dedicated to the king the quality of being a mo one more exact translation, okay, one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. 
we can look up the word exact by 16th and 17th century standards and see that that word is tied to the idea of being perfect, something being perfectly done. Okay. Now let's go to the OED and let's look up the word perfect. When we do, so here's, here's the entry in the OED for perfect. Now let's just on a flyer, go to control F and put in exact. And have it search the entry for the word exact. Not, there we go. And notice what it finds, okay? We come down here to entry six, and here's an entry. Entry 6A is related to a geometric figure. But look at 6B, accurate, correct, of a copy representation accurately reproducing or reflecting the original, exactly corresponding to the facts obsolete. So there is in the OED, an entry, a definition for perfect that ties perfect with exact. And notice that it explicitly tags this as obsolete. And then notice further in the usage examples that there is one given from the preface by Miles Smith, that the translation was not so sound and so perfect that it needed, um, not so sound and so perfect, but that it needed in many places correction. So we can come back now to the preface and let's type in perfect. And the example there that is being pulled is in this context here of talking about the LXX. Okay. Talking about the Septuagint, it is certain that that translation was not so sound and so perfect that it needed in many places correction. Okay. So what are, how is perfect being used there? Perfect is being used there, okay, in this sense. It wasn't accurate. It wasn't correct. It wasn't accurately reproducing or reflecting the original. Um, it was not exactly corresponding to the facts. So they are saying, the, uh, Miles Smith is saying, in his use of the word perfect there, according to the OED, which is marking it abs obsolete, he is saying that, in other words, that is the meaning and usage of that word perfect when it is used in that spot, Okay. Now, the word perfect occurs seven times in the preface. And here is the one that most people are going to point to. And look at it here. For, what, for, whatever, for whatever was perfect under the sun were apostles or apostolic men, that is, men endued with an extraordinary measure of God's spirit and privilege with the privilege of infallibility, had not their hand. So here we have the word perfect, and this is a different meaning. See, here perfect means the, what we modern readers understand perfect. But there is a false friend sense of perfect that is used here in the, OE, in the uh, translators to the reader. And there's a false friend sense of exact that is used in the epistle dedicatory that is escaping modern readers by the very principles that Brother Ward has set forth for identifying these things. Okay? So in this case when it's tied to an extraordinary measure of God's spirit. And in this case, it is being used in the sense of 1B. So let's scroll up to the top. And it's being used in this sense, in a state of complete excellence, free from any imperfection or defect of quality that cannot be approved upon, flawless, faultless. Okay, that is the way Smith is using this, that perfect there when he's talking about being endued with an extraordinary measure of God's spirit so that they were infallible, they could not err, versus the Septuagint being not perfect in the sense of 6b, not accurate, not correct, not accurately, um, let me find it right here, at not accurate, not correct, okay, uh, not reproducing or reflecting the original or exactly corresponding to the facts. So we know, even people that just read the AV, let's go back to my notes, we know that there are multiple meanings of the word perfect, okay? We know this. So this raises the question of what did the English word perfect mean in the late 16th and early 17th century when the author of the epistle dedicatory ascribed the, this quality to the AV? 
The word perfect does not have its own entry in the 1604 table alphabetical, but it is used to define the following words by Robert Condry, absolute, exquisite, and mature. This tells us that in the early 17th century, when the AV was translated, that perfect possessed multiple different meanings in English. The readers of the AV, readers of the AV know this to be the case when they encounter verses like 2 Timothy 3.17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The word perfect in this verse means mature, according uh, as recorded in the table alphabetical. Okay, The OED elaborates upon the meaning of the word perfect during the time period in question with more detail than we can cover in this lesson, and it is instructive to note that there is a connection between exact and, and perfect in definition 6b. Exact, correct, specifically of a copy representation accurately reproducing or reflecting the original of a notion thought exactly corresponding to the facts. Okay, so then I talk in my notes here about the example from the epistle dedicatory, all right? Now we can go a step further here and we can look this up in the Middle English Dictionary because this is the word that the Middle English word that the modern English word of perfect is coming from. And notice that the word, Middle English word, had multiple meanings, flawless, unblemished. To me, that would go along with sense 1B at the top. And then we are looking, though, at 6B. And then if we come back over here, look at number 5. Exact, precise, corresponding exactly to a type or standard. Notice perfect tied to exact, precise, and corresponding exactly to a type or standard, precisely what the OED says here for 6b, that it marks obsolete. So, did the King James translators view their work as perfect? Okay, did they view their work as perfect? The King James translators, according to their own testimony, compared English Bibles with the original sacred tongues, along with other foreign language Bibles, to produce one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. Their estimation of their work was that it was exact, i.e. perfectly done, in that it was accurate, correct, and accurately reproducing or reflecting the original. Put another way, they viewed their work as perfectly representing the contents of the original sacred tongues in English. So, I am saying that the translators definitely believe their work was exact slash perfect by this precise definition and meaning of perfect. Accurate, correct, accurately reproducing or reflecting the original, accurately corresponding to the facts, exactly corresponding to the facts. They did not believe that anything that they put in the 1611 was a known misrepresentation of the original and Hebrew Greek text. So you need to be understanding what I'm saying here. I am saying exact and perfect in a very circumscribed, limited sense of 6b, in the entry for perfect, and also one that, again, for exact, of qualities, conditions, attainments, finished, refined, perfect. I have presented a swath of research here to show what exact meant, that exact was tied to perfect, and there's a specific meaning of perfect that they are intending to convey here when they use these terms, and that the word perfect is used in more than one sense in the in the translators to the reader itself. The OED itself bears this out. Okay. So put another way, they view their work as perfectly representing the contents of the original sacred tongues in English. Now here's the thing. So people can only think about this using one understanding of perfect, simply stated, cannot be improved upon. That is not the way the translators were referring to their work as perfect or, or exact. They were referring to it as precise, as stating in English what the text said in Hebrew and Greek, okay? And they did so, so they call their work exact by perfectly done, 
by table alphabetical and a bunch of other definitional uh, examples that I gave you. And they did so while rejecting verbatim identicality at, of wording as the standard. This is evidenced by the section of the preface where Smith, Smith explains that they had, quote, not tied themselves to a uniformity of phrasing or to an identity of words when doing their work. And this is further evidenced by the alternative readings offered in the margins of the AV, which I'll have a lot more to say about in the future. OK, so. Folks. I'm making an argument here. Based upon the existence of false friends in the epistle dedicatory and in the um, translators to the reader, that the King James translators absolutely viewed their work as exact, okay, perfectly done, and they viewed it as, according to definition 6b, accurate, correct, accurately reproducing or reflecting the original, exactly corresponding to the facts, obsolete. In their mind, there were no known errors in what they did in the sense of misrepresenting what the text said. Now, obviously, they are not adopting the idea of cannot be improved upon as their standard because there are places where they admit the text is difficult and they state in the margins, uh, you know, Clarif clarifying type notes. And they also did not lock themselves into an identity of phrasing where they said, listen, there's more than one way to state in English what the text says in Hebrew and Greek and have it still be correct. So they did not tie themselves into an identity of phrasing. So I think there are false friends in this conversation. And I think that they have not been accurately understood and unpacked. And I think when they are understood and unpacked, you come to the realization that the translators believed their work was exact, perfectly done, in the sense of 6b. It is accurately representing in English what the original contents say. So let me read it again from my notes here. Okay. The King James translators, according to their own testimony, compared prior English Bibles with the original sacred tongues, along with other foreign language Bibles, to produce one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into English. Their estimation of their work was that it was exact, perfectly done, and that it was accurate, correct, and accurately reproducing or reflecting the original. Put another way, they viewed their work as perfectly representing the contents of the original sacred tongues in English. They are meaning it in an obsolete sense of the word perfect. They are meaning it in an obsolete sense of the word exact that escapes modern readers because when modern readers think of perfect, they think of perfect in the sense of 1B. Let me show you again. 1B cannot be improved upon flawless, faultless. That's the way they're thinking about it. The King James translators were thinking about exact and perfect. Not from the sense of 1B, but from the sense of meaning 6B. And I would submit that they use the word perfect in more than one way in the translators to the reader. So, Listen, I, I would just say, you know, if 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 if, if you're going to use the OED to declare things to be false friends and et cetera, then you need to uh, we need to use we need to be consistent in our use and application of the o, of the OED. So I know that this video is going to make some people thrilled to death with me and other people you know, extremely angry with me. But if you're going to, if you're going to pose what I've presented here, I need to see a case made for what, for how and what I've presented using the table alphabetical, using the OED, using the lexicons of modern English, using the middle English dictionary, and how this is not the case.
So do I believe that the King James translators thought their work was perfect? Yes. In the sense of 6B, accurate, precise, and exactly reproducing the contents of the original, they thought that their work was an accurate representation in English of what the original language text said through a long, laborious process of comparing the original sacred tongues with prior English Bibles and foreign language Bibles to arrive at one more exact translation into the English tongue, exact meaning by the standards of the table alphabetical, perfectly done. So there's my case for the issue of did the translators view the King James Bible as being perfect, um, all, taking into account the idea of false friends. It's been a long video. I appreciate your attention. I thought possibly of breaking it up, but I, I, I might make one more, kind of showing a few more things here <laughs> next week. But appreciate your attention. If you're interested in getting this class information, please consider checking out my From This Generation Forever class. There's a blog spot format, which I did finally update. And then there's also the format of the church's website. <clears throat> there are two different formats. Same information is available. I am also on this channel every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, migrating information off of uh, a different U uh, different Saints YouTube channel and rebroadcasting the earlier lessons here. Uh, I'm doing this every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 a.m here on this YouTube channel. Please check it out if you are interested in getting the prior lessons. Listen, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ and you've never come to a place where you've acknowledged that your works cannot save you and the only hope that you have is to, is to trust and rely exclusively on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross as the only total complete payment for your sin, when you believe and trust that Christ died on the cross for your sin and was buried and rose again, you will receive eternal life as a free gift. Place your faith into the faith of Christ, into his faith, his fidelity, that he accomplished it, that he was trustworthy to satisfy the offended justice of God on your behalf. And when you place your faith into the faith of Christ, you will receive the free gift of eternal life. And you'll be taken out from under the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you next time.